Good afternoon. This is Sarah Burns. I'm uh, with the low incidence team with the school and family supports at Alberta Education. And I'm here today to uh, welcome two people who are going to be speaking about working together with Indigenous people. The, um, Megan Stock is a registered speech language pathologist based out of Edmonton. She is for the past eight years, Megan has uh, lost her practice with the First Nations communities. Much of her work has involved providing services directly to the communities as a speech language pathologist. In 2017, Megan incorporated, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this correct, Megan, uh, Tama, Tamaka Therapy Services, which has grown to a team of 21 allied health professionals, including speech language pathologists, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, psychologists, and a mediator restorative practices facilitator. Crystal Plant is an Owasic Indigenous Child and Family Engagement Coordinator at the Stollery Children's Hospital. She is a member of the Drift Pile Cree Nation in the Treaty 8 Territory. Her unique position is to host and support Indigenous families at the Stollery. This position embraces services within an Indigenous framework and follows the recommendations brought about by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. She is currently also a student at the U of A and is studying Indigenous Community Industry Relations Program. Crystal is involved with her community, which keeps her connected with her Cree culture. Thank you, Crystal and Megan, for um, taking the time to develop this workshop. And I'm going to pass the mic over to you now. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, Sarah. Um, we would like to begin uh, by acknowledging Treaty 6 territory, the ancestral and traditional territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, Nakota Sioux, Nakota Sioux, as well as the Métis. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples whose footsteps have marked these lands for generations. Tonse, we are grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who, have who are still with us today and those who have gone before us. Our recognition of this land is an act of reconciliation and an expression of our gratitude to those whose territory we reside on or are visiting. Next slide. Uh, so Sarah gave a, a nice introduction already. Um, so I'll just quickly say that, um, so I'm, I'm Megan Stock and I'm, as uh, Sarah said, a speech language pathologist. And since 2011, most of my work has been in First Nations communities across Alberta. Um, much of that work was all assessment related. So uh, I spent years observing the barriers and challenges that many First Nations families uh, faced in accessing services. Uh, a lot of the time, a children, uh, sorry, a child uh, diagnosed with um, a need for intervention uh, would have to travel 45 minutes or an hour and, or maybe up to three hours in order to, to get to services, which um, became my strong motivation to create this team of, uh, of professionals who could uh, travel out and, and provide services to, to families in their home communities. Um, I'm also a Teddy Bear Fair coordinator, so I coordinate health, uh, wellness and safety fairs on First Nations all over Alberta. Uh, and so that again serves to identify children. Needs. So I'm very thrilled about um, people's interest in learning more and about changes that we're, we're seeing uh, in, in getting services out to communities. Um, and just before I, I pass you over to Crystal, I, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to share my experiences um, in preparing for a project like this. I, I do a lot of additional reading and, and have a lot more conversations. And um, I have felt very blessed by the conversations I've had with Crystal and the learning that I've um, uh, gone through in this project and the wisdom and experiences that Crystal has shared with me. Uh, so I'll pass you on to Crystal now. Um, okay, well, thank you very much, Megan. That was very, 
Nice and sweet. Uh, as stated earlier, uh, my name is Crystal Font. I'm a Nihi Awaskoyo from Drift Pile Cree First Nations in the Treaty 8 Territory. Um, I'm a part of the Stollery Awasasuk Indigenous Health Program as the Child and Family Engagement Coordinator. Um, the, a little background on the Awasasuk team is uh, that we are the first in-hospital pediatric Indigenous program in Canada, which we are very happy to say and proud to say. Um, our program was created out of ceremony and also uh, was developed through the implementation of uh, talking circles, which uh, were um, held in various communities in Treaty 6 and 8. Um, we went and we gathered information from previous patients, uh, family members, staff that are out in the community, and how yeah. could we uh, best service the Indigenous children that come to the hospital there. And through that, my role was actually created, um, which was to kind of be a host to the Indigenous families that came to the Stollery. Um, a lot of our families come from those very remote areas. A big building, um, such as the size of the hospital, can be super intimidating, and I can uh, kind of be a guide for them and provide comfort and support as they journey through such a difficult time as having a, a, a sick child. So. Um, I also have the wonderful opportunity to work with Megan and uh, travel with her to the various teddy bear, teddy bear fairs that are held out in the communities and there um, we can engage with the community members and, and I myself particularly can promote the Awasasic program, they can get to know my face, so when they do come to the hospital they feel comfortable to reach out and uh, we can provide support to them. So thank you very much for having me here today and I look forward to the rest of the webinar. Next slide. So I'll just quickly run over the objectives of our, of our presentation today. Um, first of all, uh, uh, Crystal, uh, sorry, Crystal is going to share the very valuable uh, information of how to talk about Indigenous people. I, I love this information because it, it, for a long time I didn't know how to um, find out if someone was Dene or Stoney or, or Cree, um, and this really helps us have some perspective on, on Indigenous peoples in Canada. Um, I'll talk about some factors um, that I've compiled and I've, I've um, also found a lot of support in, in research and through conversation for, for these factors that contribute to a successful and positive relationship with Indigenous people. Uh, Crystal's going to offer some um, insights around cultural understanding and building knowledge of real world uh, conditions. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some considerations when working with students, families and schools in First Nations communities. Uh, while I'm sure many of you are aware of Jordan's principle, we're just going to review um, the story of uh, Jordan River Anderson, Anderson and, uh, and talk about, ensure that, that everybody is aware about Jordan's principle because it has served to uh, have a very positive effect in um, helping children on, on and off reserve. Um, Kristen, or Crystal is going to share uh, insights into Indigenous ways of knowing and being and then we'll just share with you some um, resources that we're familiar with for opportunities uh, for professional development and Indigenous healthcare resources. Next slide. Great, so um, yeah, uh, Megan went over the first objective and uh, uh, we're going to just uh, show a brief video on how to talk to Indigenous people and the correct terminology uh, that is preferred. Um, I get that question quite a bit as an Indigenous staff member within the hospital. I have people come up to me and they, um, they ask me, I don't know which uh, correct term to use. Do I use Aboriginal? Uh, I know not to use Indian. Um, so this uh, is just a brief video uh, of kind of just guidelines of uh, what can be utilized. Uh, another good question that I want to bring up, it's really simple, uh, but it's a, a really insightful question is when you're working with um, Indigenous people, it, 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 it's a good uh, uh, question to ask where you're from. So um, with that question, it sounds basic, 
but it's a good uh, strategy for building relationships. Um, it's an opportunity for people to, um, to, to not only say where they're from, but it's an acknowledgement of the land of where their ancestors are from. So it connects people to their nation and their land. And it opens the door to learn more about the people and provide insights into their lives. And it's really like a grassroots approach um, uh, of, of, of how to engage with Indigenous people. So uh, with that being said, if we are able to just start the video, it's, uh, it's very brief, and, uh, but it's really insightful. So enjoy. Indigenous, First Nations, Inuit, Métis, Aboriginal? There are so many different terms out there that it can be kind of confusing if you don't know what they all mean. But actually, it might be simpler than you think. I'm Ozzy Michelin and I'm an Inuk journalist from Northwest River Labrador and I'm here to teach you how to talk about Indigenous people in Canada. Let's start with the term Indigenous. According to the United Nations, there are 370 million Indigenous people worldwide spread across 70 countries. In Canada, there are approximately 1.4 million people who identify as Indigenous. Here, there are three distinct groups that make up the term Indigenous, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. First Nations is the largest and most varied group of Indigenous people, and they can be found from coast to coast to coast. Sometimes I hear people using the term Indigenous and First Nations as if they were interchangeable, but they're not. Using Indigenous when you're referring to a specific group is kind of like saying Asian when you're referring to the Vietnamese or South Korean. It works sometimes, but if you use it all the time, it just sounds wrong. The rule of thumb is to be as specific as possible. If somebody's Cree, it's okay to refer to them as being Cree. And if you don't know, ask them how they self-identify. Next are the Métis. The Métis are the descendants of First Nations and European settlers, and often refer to a distinct geographic group coming from the historic Northwest. You can find Métis all across Canada, but they all share a unique, distinct cultural heritage. The Inuit are the maritime circumpolar people of Canada, with a homeland stretching all the way from Siberia to Greenland. In Canada, there are four Inuit homelands, but they're not all just north of 60, with populations in both Quebec and Labrador. In the Inuit language, Inuktitut, the word Inuit means people. And you might have heard the term Inuk before. Inuk means person. So remember, it's one Inuk, many Inuit. And don't say Inuit people, because that's redundant. So that's it for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. But what about Aboriginal? Do we still even use that term? Well, generally, no. It's out there still, but it's being replaced by Indigenous, which is an internationally used term. So remember these simple rules if you want to get it right. Be as specific as possible. If you're referring to one person or one community, then name it. If there's more than one community or people, then use the broader terms like First Nations, Inuit, or Métis. If there are different groups together, then say Indigenous. And if you don't know, ask. Most people are happy to tell you about where they're from and where their parents are from and where their grandparents are from and where their whole family is from. That's kind of how it works in the Indigenous world. Thanks. I hope that helps. Now, Uh So just a really quick review. Um, so there are three groups in Canada for, of Indigenous people, the First Nations, um, which have also, as we talked about, they previously or at, at one time or another been referred to as Native, Aboriginal and Indian. So Indian remains in use in Canadian law and history and is the legal identity of an Indigenous person who is registered under the Indian Act. However, in general, this term is considered outdated, uh, outdated and offensive. Um, Métis, so that was European fur traders and settlers began uh, to associate with and marry First Nations women soon after arrival into North America and children of those unions were Métis. Uh, Alberta has the greatest population of Métis people in Canada and then the Inuit are people of Canadian Arctic and the majority of Inuit live in 51 communities across Inuit Nunangat. Um, so the total Indigenous population in Canada is approximately uh, 2,070,000 people. Um, and according to Statistics Canada in 2011, there are 634 First Nations or bands in Canada and 3,100 reserves. Um, language is the defining element of a culture and there are 53 languages and over 200 dialects, which compose the 11 North American uh, Indigenous groups. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, um, 
uh, specific to Alberta First Nations, uh, there's approximately 45 nations in three treaty areas. So Treaty 6 is the blue area in southern Alberta. Um, oh, so I'm sorry, Treaty 7 is, <laughs> is uh, northern Alberta. Um, and then Treaty 6 is uh, where we reside, uh, uh, the land we live on, and that is in central Alberta. And then um, Treaty 8 uh, covers a large portion of, of northern Alberta. So there's 140 reserves covering over 800,000 hectares of reserve land. The most commonly spoken First Nations languages in Alberta are Cree, Blackfoot, Dene, Sarsi, and Stony or Nakoda Sioux. Okay, so um, I just wanted to kind of chime in here uh, uh, regarding language and how uh, actually language is, is an endangered concept for a lot of Indigenous communities. And a large um, factor to that was the effects of residential school. So it is estimated that 150,000 children were removed from their families and communities and placed in residential schools. While interned in the schools, the children were forbidden to speak their home language. And if they did, they often were subjected to horrific forms of punishment. When the children returned home for holidays, they were frequently too traumatized to converse in their language. And when they had children of their own, they frequently did not teach or encourage them to speak their, language, their home language, in part because their fluency had been impacted, in part because they feared their children would suffer the same punishment, and in part because they believed their children needed fluency in the dominant language, which was English. I multiply that scenario through a few generations and we have a 2016 statistic of just 16% of the Indigenous people being able to speak an Indigenous language. So, um, you know, just a, a little personal insight uh, into my history, which is, is the fact that my Musham and Cookham, which is my, my uh, grandfather and my grandmother, uh, and as well as my father all went to residential schools so I have a multi-generational history of uh, of that effect and how um, Cree was very fluently spoken by my grandmother and my grandfather and my father uh, you know he could hold a good conversation in Cree uh, but um, uh, myself I don't I, I speak very little Cree. So um, it's, it's kind of that trickle down effect of, of where the language stopped at certain generations. And um, there, there are communities out there that I, that I must note that have a very strong um, ties to having uh, their uh, Cree, for instance, as their first language. Um, Fox Lake, for example, uh, they speak fluent Cree up there, and I'll talk more about that community later. But I just wanted to to note uh, the effects of residential school and how that had a trickle down effect to the generations and uh, and not being able to speak indig indigenous languages. Next slide. So um, I'm just going to talk right now about some general strategies to build successful and positive relationships with Indigenous people. Um, of course, a lot of this information is um, our strategies we might use with anybody, but uh, these particularly stand out uh, in some aspects resulting from historical um, uh, events. And, and so some of these uh, points are a little bit um, more profound when working in First Nations. Uh, so uh, one of the, the um, considerations is to, uh, through educational opportunities, engaging with Indigenous people, taking opportunities to participate in culture activities, cultural activities, um, to build an understanding of historical context. This is essential in order to, to just begin to understand why things are as they are today, um, which can really facilitate um, impacting change. Um, the next thing is to build cultural knowledge. 
it's really important to recognize that each nation is unique and there can be great variation in their language and cultural and spiritual practices. Um, even two communities very close in proximity might practice, uh, have different cultural practices. So um, we really have to enter a community realizing their uniqueness and their, their, um, their own uh, cultural ways and not make any assumptions based on experiences perhaps in another community. Um, the next point is to understand real world conditions and, and Chris, Chris, uh, Crystal's gonna talk a little bit more about this. Um, but these factors will play a really big role potentially in how you work with indigenous people, or sorry, with individuals in various communities. Um, the next thing is to learn core values of indigenous people, which include, of course, among others, uh, trust, family and relationships, spirituality, nature, and elders. So understanding and considering these things in your interactions is essential because as you learn and witness how deeply uh, traditional or cultural practices are rooted in their daily lives, you'll f you will further understand the importance of um, considering these when you work together. Um, also, uh, when you visit a community, ask the adults and, and the elders questions about, about their nation and how we can demonstrate respect for their culture you know find out what they feel is important for you to know um, and they're usually very willing to teach you about their beliefs traditional practices uh, and spirituality um, and finally um, look for opportunities to participate in their cultural or traditional events while there can be some specific protocol in how to um, interact at these events or how to show up at the events um, uh, usually they're very, you know, everyone is welcome. And I think that's, might be a misperception sometimes that if you're not indigenous or you're not of that community, you're not invited. But um, in my experience, and Crystal, you can probably mention something about this too, but um, they're very welcoming and they love to, to share and engage um, others in, in their cultural and traditional practices. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, moving on to the next slide. Uh, so I wanted to bring attention, attention to Fox Lake, which is a community that uh, my team works with at the Stollery uh, quite often. So um, I'm not sure if you guys heard of it before, but it is uh, about, I would say, uh, 10 hour drive to Fox Lake, I believe. Um, so it, it's, it's a fair bit away. So a little bit of stats regarding Fox Lake is the majority of Little Red Cree Nation live in Fox Lake, which is a group of reserves. And that's about the equivalent of 2,800 people. Uh, the rest of the population live in either John Doerr Prairie or Garden River where for a total population of 4,368 people. Um, it is uh, remote access to this community. Uh, there you can either fly in or you can take a barge uh, to uh, go across the lake or in the wintertime there's an ice road. Um, the economy there is pretty spotty. Uh, there's uh, they have a, a water treatment uh, uh, plant where a few jobs are accessed through there and they also have a, a, a northern grocery store and um, their water can be spotty at time as time as uh, as well so they do have frequent boil advisories uh, the nearest pharmacy is in Fort Vermilion and um, for their healthcare facility they have a nursing station so um, if you kind of look at the pictures that are located on the slide, you can see that ice road um, that you can travel on in the winter. When we go um, for our talking circles around the April uh, uh, timeframe, uh, that can be a scary trip across the, that ice bridge, uh, not gonna lie. Um, there are pictures of, uh, I, I know it's kind of blurry, but 
the food there in the northern grocery store is actually very expensive. So the milk, for instance, a four liter was priced when we took the picture at $15. And the bag of oranges was, I believe, around the $12 range. Um, now this community is, they are, uh, their first language is Cree. So um, when they come to the hospital, um, it's a, uh, it can be a bit of a language barrier for some of the staff members to try to communicate uh, uh, difficult and complex medical um, uh, treatments that their child is getting. So um, it's a little bit of a kind of a snapshot into the community. So I'm gonna uh, move into a story uh, that can give you kind of a, a glimpse into a parenting perspective for when they leave uh, the stallery, stallery. So I want you to imagine your child being at the Stollery Children's Hospital, approximately a thousand kilometers away from your home community. You have been told by the healthcare team your child is being discharged on a Friday afternoon. You have also been given a prescription for antibiotics for your child. You and your child have no private transportation back home, so you have to take a bus. You board the bus at 10.30 a.m. and start your 10-hour journey to a northern town, which is more than likely high level. Uh, once you're off the bus, you realize you, were, you have to get that prescription filled. You walk to the nearest drugstore with your child in tow and give the prescription to the pharmacist. The pharmacist states, we don't have that dosage in stock for children. You have to come back next week. Then you have to walk back to the bus station and get picked up by another vehicle to travel approximately an hour and 45 minutes to your community, which is Fox Lake, which includes stopping by the lakeside to wait for a barge to pick you up. Now that barge costs $50 one way uh, for you to get back into your community. Uh, these are some of the real life challenges First Nations and Métis families face when they're accessing the Alberta healthcare system. Um, it's a good insight into, you know, um, uh, a real world perspective our families face on a, on a daily basis and um, some of the recommendations, you know, when we, when we do work with those families from the, the remote communities is to make sure you come from a place of empathy and understanding of the challenges Indigenous patients, families and communities face, you know, uh, as an Awasasic team member, we're, we're constantly having to advocate for our families regarding, say they miss an appointment, a follow-up appointment. You know, that's a 12-hour trek for, for that family to make that follow-up appointment. And, you know, something like the weather can affect them from coming. If, if the weather's bad, they, you can't fly in or out. You can't, you can't travel across the lake. So um, there's lots of concepts uh, that people forget about when they work with our Indigenous families of, of why uh, some of the barriers that exist for them for accessing these services. So um, thank you for listening to me about uh, our Fox Lake folks. I just want to add um, about crossing the the um, ice the ice roads. Uh, the first time I went along with somebody driving me uh, across the ice road. It's they, four o'clock. Sorry about that. We um, the sh I was asked to take my seatbelt off and roll down the window. <laughs> so that was a little <laughs> nerve wracking. But yeah, so you there's three ways into to Fox Lake, depending on the time of year. So you either fly in or you have to take the ice road or you, or you have the nice experience of, of taking a barge across across the river. Um, but that also carries with it time timing factors and things that can can hold you up. Um, so we'll talk about those kind of awarenesses when we're working with the communities a little more. Um, I also really love to share my experiences the first time I went there, um, realizing that the children there all speak Cree as mm -hmm. their first language. And then they come into school and, and they're amazing and how quickly um, and um, how well they learn English and then they, so they do all their schooling in English and then they, uh, uh, 
but communicating with their friends and family is all increased. So it's really, it's really neat to see, but also helps us understand that we need to consider um, communication and, and make sure that we're accounting for those differences. And we'll talk about that a little bit more um, in a few slides. So we'll carry on to the next slide. I would just like to share some considerations when working um, as, as professionals or therapists or educators, um, working with students, families and schools in First Nations communities. Um, so historically and still today, uh, the healthcare system presents many gaps and barriers for First Nations individuals and communities. And so we really need to work proactively and in collaboration to address these gaps and barriers. Um, so engaging with our clients and their caregivers uh, or approaching them um, as a learning partner and a collaborator is essential. We really need to ask for information and create a bigger picture uh, and understand the individual that we're helping. There can be some very important home, family or other factors that will be important considerations in our approach to service provision. Um, historically and still today, many Indigenous communities practice generational caretaking uh, for, for a variety of different reasons. So a grandmother may be raising several grandchildren and may have many obligations. Uh, so we might need to take into consideration that, that that grandma might require support in order to follow through on our recommendations or implement the use of equipment or you know any kind of rec recommendation that we're making so we have to really ensure that the individual and you know if it's a ch uh, if it's a child their caregivers play a key role in the determination of their services um, so rather entering the the, the meeting or or, or um, joining the group with uh, you know, kind of an authoritative, authoritative approach on the subject. It's it's nice to approach the gathering with the knowledge that an attitude that we have much to share, but also a lot to learn. Um, so I I just want to encourage everyone not to be afraid to ask for their ideas and advice. Um, and if you have a challenge or question, um, seek their help by requesting their assistance, we demonstrate respect, humility, and a willingness to learn from them. And as long as we're a genuine in, in this approach, we'll really foster a positive relationship. Uh, the next point is um, uh, that it's important to understand the jurisdictional boundaries for healthcare funding for Indigenous people living on reserve. And I know we've kind of brought this up a couple of times, but there is a federal and provincial discrepancy. Um, so still today, AHS doesn't typically fund the provision of, of health-related services on reserve. Um, and additionally, there's, I, I've, I've witnessed this, this myself, that there's many misconceptions about who's allowed to go on reserve. Um, you know, when I'm coordinating the teddy bear affairs, I'm inviting all kinds of um, professionals to come. And I've had some people say to me, well, I that, express that they need some kind of special invite. Well, I mean, of course, the, the, the community needs to want, uh, you know, our involvement in our services, but there's no special invite where you know, they, they are very welcoming and, and, um, and again, it doesn't have to be anything formal uh, in order for us to work there. Um, and it's only over the past couple of years that funding has been available for professions like, you know, speech pathologists, occupational therapists, audiologists, um, that funding has allowed them to deliver services in the First Nations communities. Uh, so people may not be familiar with what we do. So um, we need to find opportunities to increase awareness in the community ab about our profession and what, how we can benefit uh, the people we're working with. Um, there's often preschool fairs or health fairs or career fairs. Um, if you have those opportunities to join in and, and have conversations with, um, with parents and families um, that can really help um, uh, that can really facilitate collaboration and, and make for a better working relationship. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is just informed consent. Uh, and, and there's some real important considerations there because um, there can be challenges in getting informed consent, especially if you're working with a child in a program or school setting. In my experience, often uh, I'm invited in through the program or the community, and it may not even be possible for me to directly connect with a parent or a guardian. Um, and, and 
still we need their consent and uh, and it can sometimes be challenging to get that so you could potentially arrive in the community and find that consent has not been obtained so this is something that you really want to um, discuss with a community contact before you come to make sure that that uh, that, that's in place um, and then also just in terms of informed consent um, on the part of the per, of, of the, the, the individual or the parent or guardian uh, sometimes there's speech and language differences that can impact understanding so we really need to ensure that those we are helping and their caregivers whenever possible under, understand agree with and share our goals for the individual um, and consider when in a place like if you're uh, have the wonderful opportunity to go to Fox Lake or, or John Dor Prairie or Garden River, um, consider whether an interpreter would be beneficial. Um, there's many people in those communities, many professionals, um, community health representatives that speak both languages and, and are, are very helpful in making sure that um, communication works as best as possible. Um, so the next thing is to ensure that the person, family or facility or school or program have the proper resources to fully implement our recommendations or intervention. So whether that's, you know, through support personnel or materials or the room or the environment, um, it, it's just really important that we don't come in with a recommendation and leave and just expect it to go well. Uh, we have to know that, that everything's in place to, to help it work. Um, one example that I've had in the past was, uh, and I know I'm, I meant to find the right word for this, I, I don't think this is the right terminology, and if, if I could hear um, some of you speak, you could probably correct me, but um, a, like a classroom sound amplification system, I, I had I was uh, um, given the opportunity to purchase the um, Red Cat systems for some schools, and, um, and I left them there, uh, we went through, you know, the basis, basics of what to do, but I, I, you know, we required maybe a custodian or somebody to help put it up. And um, I realized if, if I didn't kind of follow up on that, then, then little things might have um, caused it not to happen at all. So uh, we do need to make sure, and that leads me into another point about um, follow up, which I'll come to in a minute, but um, we just have to make sure that they have what they need to, to um, follow up on what, what we're doing and, that it, and to make sure it will, it will work well. Um, and so I, uh, Crystal kind of reminded me of this point that we, we need to have a key contact in the community to, to help um, do this, um, to make sure that recommendations, um, the, the resources are in place, and that and can help with ongoing follow-up and to ensure that things are working well. Um, so like I said, uh, so it, it might be a um, PA in a school or a teacher or, or in the community, it might be the community health representative or maternal child health worker or a teacher, um, but, but it's important to have that key uh, person to, to um, help um, facilitate what we're doing on ongoing. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is um, to remember that and to realize or, or learn and understand that every First Nation has strong and rich traditional or cultural practices. Um, so it's really helpful to build our knowledge of their values and traditions and ask, you know, and find out, like we said before, what, what they feel is important for us to know. So we may want to find out whether the community follows a traditional or a Christian based beliefs or if they practice certain ceremonies regularly, some schools will smudge every morning before um, they settle into their classes. Um, some schools have a, a round dance in the mornings or occasionally. Um, so, and, and again, if you learn that they do that, you, you may take the opportunity to join in because they're quite a, uh, it can be a beautiful experience. Um, also, uh, many indigenous people believe that uh, one of the ways in which knowledge is acquired is through experience and interactions with other humans, animals, and the natural environment. And this view is based on the belief that everyone is connected with all living and non-living things. Um, so Indigenous ways of learning include observation, experiential learning, and oral 
story, storytelling. So if you can consider that information and, and determine whether you could apply that into the way you engage with those that you're working with, that can be very, very valuable and, and a demonstration of respect. Um, as professionals entering their community, we have a responsibility to honor who they are and where they're from. Uh, colonization tried to strip Indigenous people of their identity, culture, and language, and we can contribute to the healing process by learning about them and incorporating their values into our programming um, and use their language when possible. If you know of a, of a word or two or ask, ask about their language um, and, and then do your best to teach them or work with them within culturally relevant themes. Uh, next slide. Oh, so this is me continuing a little bit. Uh, I, I know this is really largely comes from, oh, did you want to step in? Or? No, no, okay. No. Uh, this comes from, uh, based in, from a speech language pathologist perspective, but I really feel like there could potentially, it could apply to other um, professions, because I know there's a variety of professions that we're, we're talking to. Um, but I just want to talk a little bit about formalized assessments and reporting. Um, so I think um, depending on your professional area of specialty, I, I think that if it's uh, a physical um, thing you're looking at or area you're looking at, uh, that might be a little bit um, more consistent, you know, across people. But in my experience as a, as a speech pathologist, and last week I had a conversation with an OT that agreed that standardized assessments often aren't ideal for anyone. Um, and, and definitely regarding speech and language assessments, what we have available to date are not sensitive to Indigenous populations. They, they don't account for social, speech, and language variations of the various and diverse First Nations um, across, well, anywhere. Um, but in many cases, formal assessments are still often required by schools, programs, and funding agencies. So we're often obligated to conduct them and provide and, and come out with diagnoses and severity ratings. So I think I just want to point out that we, we need to be very aware and, and really considerate of, um, of the assessments that we're using and whether, uh, whether they're... Um, maybe missing some cultural differences. And I mean, in some cases it's unavoidable, but what we can do is make sure that we're very descriptive when we report outcomes. Um, we can make sure that we make efforts to identify when differences are based on culture or when they are actual developmental or physical differences that, you know, that um, should be, should, that may require intervention. Um, and, and ensure that we communicate that well to to our to the families. Um, and there isn't a lot of data, and in some cases any data regarding the dialectal variations of English in individual First Nations communities. So as speech pathologists, we really need to take the time to observe the communication patterns of community members. I think this is valuable information to anybody because it's important to know when you're speaking to somebody that they're they're different, um, you know, like their 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 accent or their grammatical patterns aren't reflective of any kind of delay, but more um, they're they're uh, consistent with their first language and passed down through the generations. Um, and just for interest sake, I'll mention some specific differences that I've noted um, is uh, Dene and Cree people uh, don't have a sh sound and use it the same way we do. So they um, will say sues for shoes um, or um, C for she. Uh, and they also don't tend to have a TH sound in the same way we do. So they might replace it with D or T. Um, and also, interestingly, the, the Cree language doesn't have gender pronouns in, in the same way that English does. And so you'll hear many adults use he for everyone. And so children will often say he for everyone, um, which uh, here, you know, among um, um, Caucasian children that uh, you know, if a if a five year old is using he for she, we might think of that as a, a, uh, consistent with a language delay. But we have to recognize that in, in the Cree language or in Cree communities, that just may be a cultural dialectal variation or of, of their language. 
Um, so I just let, uh, want to encourage everybody to be sensitive to our to the, to our um, assessments and and really do our best to identify those differences. Um, and then also about severity ratings, I wanted to to talk, uh, and I better quickly <laughs> talk about the fact that. Uh, we have to be really sensitive when we are describing assessment outcomes. I don't know how this um, may um, be in, in other professions, but in the area of speech and language, a child might have, you know, might present with a severe speech delay. They might have age appropriate language. Um, but when we communicate severe speech delay, that, you know, any given individual may not know how to interpret that and it may they may see it as something cognitively related or, you know, whereas a speech delay can simply be something that they will, you know, outgrow. Um, and we just want to um, assist them so that, you know, at a, it, you know, provide early intervention so that it doesn't have future impact on literacy development and that kind of thing. But we should be very clear in helping them understand that a, that a severe delay may be something that they'll completely come out of and that it, you know, really the, the level of impact that has on, on who they are in their life uh, because we don't want to mislead someone to think it's something really horrible, which that word does sound horrible. Um, yeah, and the final thing I wanted to say is just in terms of our reporting, uh, we really need to write reports in straightforward functional language and, and make sure that we explain um, if we're using medical terms that we explain it well um, and avoid acronyms and jargon. Um, and when uh, because um, when we consider the fact that there are, you know, that there can be language differences and familiarity differences in, in what we're talking about, um, reports can be really um, daunting and, and confusing. So uh, you just write in a way that anyone can understand to the best of your ability. Um, so I, another thing I just want to refer to uh, in the next slide, uh, quickly, I just want to draw your attention uh, to the speech language pathology and audiology uh, services um, for First Nations position statement. Um, I, I uh, was, I participated on the ad hoc committee for speech language and audiology Canada um, uh, on the, in this committee to, to create this position statement. So it was uh, com comprised of, of many individuals, speech pathologists and audiologists who had some experience working with First Nations. And together we came up with, um, with some uh, recommendations. I think that they apply to, you know, any communication health assistants or, or audiologists or speech pathologists. So I think they're valid. And in fact, they, they're, they're, be, they're um, important for anyone uh, working with First Nations people. So I just wanted to highlight, I, I've left a link so that you're, well, you know, you can uh, pull it up if you like, but I just kind of wanted to um, discuss uh, the ways that we came to that health or, or that our profession can contribute to the process of reconciliation. So one is, and a lot of this is review of what we've been talking about already, but uh, the first one was respecting First Nations autonomy including uh, their right and responsibility to direct their own health and education programs. Um, we can't just assume we know what's best. We have to really be guided by their values and wishes. Um, the next thing is uh, recognizing the cultural, linguistic, and geographical diversity of First Nations. So we're really uh, emphasizing that point. Um, but we have to uh, recognize that when we develop services in partnership with First Nations communities and organizations. Um, we need to uh, undertake training regarding cultural humility and cultural safety. So um, cultural hu humility, these words I think are used very often. Um, I, like it's like they're buzzwords now that, that come out a lot and I don't, I, I'm not clear on what, what they mean to everybody. I think we might have interpretation. Uh, we want to use these words um, carefully uh, and make sure that we have, you know, that we um, have a good sense of what we're talking about when we, when we refer to them. 
but um, in our paper, cultural humility is, uh, involves uh, humbly acknowledging oneself as a learner when it comes to understanding another's experience. Uh, and cultural safety is an outcome based on respectful engagement that recognizes and strives to address power imbalances inherent in the healthcare system. So it results in an environment free of racism and discrimination where people can feel um, safe when receiving healthcare. Um, so another point is developing speech language pathology and audiology and other services uh, specifically designed to meet the needs of First Nations people and then also uh, seeking guidance regarding culturally safe practice. Uh, next slide. Okay, so um, yeah, we're just wondering for the sake of time if we should maybe not right now uh, show this link to Jordan's principle, um, the, the facts. I, I would expect that many of you uh, already know, um, the, you know the background to Jordan's principle, uh, but we would just, for the sake of time, we'll, we'll, we, we won't play it now, but if you even just go onto YouTube and, and, and Google it, uh, or, or sorry, search it, you'll, you'll see some videos. And if you're not familiar with Jordan, Jordan River Anderson and his story, we just highly encourage you to, um, to, uh, to learn more about it. Okay. Should I? Yeah, okay. So I, I'm just going to quickly say that in, in the spirit of Jordan's memory, um, Jordan's principle is developed to ensure that First Nations children have access to all essential services uh, in the areas of education, social development, and health. Uh, and, I, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on the, on the fact that they get that, that um, it was developed to ensure that they get it immediately. Um, and in my experience, it, it, that is the hope, but we really, we have to play a role in that. We have to help identify the need for services and supports, and, and we have to um, work together with, um, you know, the, the community members who may uh, make the application. Um, so it, it is a process, but, uh, but the hope is that they will not miss out uh, or be denied services. Um, and I also, I remember a friend of mine attended a, a symposium in Ottawa and one important message she left with was that we should never shorten Jordan's principle to an acronym. Um, use his full name or use the full name as it was developed in his honor. And to remember this young boy who uh, inspired people to advocate and make a change to improve the lives of many, many children to follow. Uh, next slide. Okay, so uh, we are on to insights oh. into Indigenous ways of okay. knowing and being. Um, so I'm going to just briefly uh, check up, uh, touch upon uh, the importance of elders. Uh, so uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so um, elders, I'll just start off and say they're like rock stars to me. So I, I find that they are uh, the collective ancient library of teachings that have been passed down from time immemorial. And um, uh, I have spent many hours listening to elders and have been, uh, 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 it's been an important layer of my journey uh, to make space and time to listen to these teachings and uh, which in turn has been a catalyst for me um, as I walk my path. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful to the elders that I've interacted with and have been blessed to learn from. Um, I wanted to note that they are the pillars of the community and can uh, be, a, once again, a catalyst of support from community members uh, once you establish a relationship with an elder. Um, so uh, this can be used, uh, I guess, uh, it's strategically when, when, when launching initiatives within communities. If you have a buy-in from elders, this can drive um, support from other community members uh, to have to be successful with uh, what you're trying to do. Um, I also wanted to note the importance of protocol when interacting with elders and 
you know, you're seeking teachings and guidance, it's appropriate to present tobacco uh, for this. And uh, I'll, ta I'll talk a little bit more about the importance of that tobacco in the medicine slide. So if we could just uh, go to the next slide. Uh, I, I, I'm going to briefly touch upon the seven sacred teachings, you know, basically these are, uh, uh, these are guides uh, and roots to um, uh, important practices, uh, not only personally, but within the community. So uh, for me, a, a, a guide for that um, is to be rooted in love, respect, courage, honesty, wisdom, humility, and truth. And uh, many indigenous organizations and communities have adopted the seven guiding principles in one form or another as a moral stepping stone and cultural foundation. Each community adapts the teachings to suit their community values. Despite where the teachings may have originated, they share the same concepts of abiding by a moral respect for all living things. So for myself, when I feel like I'm going off track, I, I always try to just reflect back onto these teachings and to stay focused within it. And when I do so, positivity and progress always seem to flow within a good place. So um, moving on to the next slide, I'm going to talk about medicines. Once again, briefly, these are the, you know, when it comes to medicines, I highly recommend uh, people seek out uh, these teachings through that protocol, perhaps search for an elder and offer that tobacco to gain deeper insights into these important concepts that are uh, near and dear to Indigenous people. So uh, some of the main um, plants that are associated um, and sacred to the First Nations, Inuit and Métis people is sage. Um, sage, ha I have been taught, ha is a woman's medicine. And there's, uh, there's certain protocols for women when they utilize these medicines, um, particularly uh, um, when women are on their moon time, it's, it, it's, uh, it, it's recommended that uh, um, these certain medicines not be burned. However, sage being a woman's medicine, that this can be burned at any time. Sweetgrass, uh, for instance, though, is a male medicine. Um, and if a woman were to be on their moon time, it would be uh, asked that they step away from the ceremony. Um, some practical uh, uses for the for sage, for instance, is to cleanse negativity. And for sweetgrass, it's to allow positive um, energies to come through. Uh, now the tobacco uh, that we talked about previously, um, when it's being offered, it signifies that creator is present during this request. And it ties the person to, um, to the, the elder who is receiving this tobacco. It almost becomes like this spiritual contractual uh, event. So um, tobacco is very important. Um, and, and integral to these uh, to these protocols. Another uh, medicine that I've been taught about is <clears throat> fungus, which is found in the northern areas, um, and it grows on trees. Uh, my mushroom, for example, always used to burn it by the door to ward off evil spirits. Um, now, I've also been taught. Uh, we have drumming ceremonies at my hospital, and I, I I've been taught that the when we burn these medicines, the spirits are attracted to the smell and they will come and sit with the drummers and the elders throughout the ceremonies and bring their, their blessings along uh, to the prayers that are being sent. Um, moving on to the next slide. Um, I think we're going to move over to the summary. If we could just go to the next slide because I know we're really pressed for time. So um, um, let Megan okay. speak. 
Yeah, um, sorry, I'll just, we'll kind of just, there's just an additional thing we wanted to add on to this, this, this first steps um, to, to, to um, building successful and positive working relationships. Um, most of this is just a review. So building knowledge and understanding. Um, so taking courses, of course, like we've said, building trusting relationships. So all successful work is built upon a foundation of this trusting relationship. Um, as Crystal talked about, seeking out elder support when possible and, and, and the, the benefits that that can create in, in your working relationship. Um, consider cultural diversity, as we, as we said, and uh, uh, Crystal, Crystal, uh, Crystal has an important message about uh, a, a great guiding principle for uh, being a collaborative partner. Yeah, so um, I, I uh, due to the colonial history and the damage that has occurred, I, I, I really want to just send home uh, the message that it, it take a collective effort to lift each other up and to be able to move forward um, out of this. Uh, um, so it's very important that there is a collaborative effort uh, um, occurs with any initiative really. I came across this saying from Jara Swidrovich who is a, an Indigenous pharmacist and he, his uh, catchphrase is kind of nothing about us without us. Um, if we want to improve the health of Indigenous people, we need to include them as part of this process. This means that we must consult with communities, family, youth and elders and we need to learn from everyone. Um, and, and that's kind of a, uh, an indigenous format way of learning. So, yeah. yeah. And, and so, last point, uh, and I know we're not supposed to introduce new points in a summary, but uh, and didn't have the chance to go back and add this in earlier. But really quickly, just want to really emphasize that you need to have flexibility in your plans. Um, there's so many variables, such as location, weather conditions, road conditions in uh, individual and family variables that can impact a schedule or plan. So um, it's important to learn about the timing of the traditional activities so you can plan your visits and work or, uh, in respect to these important events. Uh, know that if there's a death in the community, it's not uncommon for all community operations, including the band office, to shut down completely. So any previously made plans will be canceled and need to be rescheduled. Um, extreme weather like cold, can a school can shut down based on that. So really um, just have flexibility and and uh, in your in your planning um, and so I, I know we have to wind up here and I'm sorry we didn't uh, have time for questions I don't know if that was an option um, I'm gonna leave you uh, we will leave you with these professional development opportunities and educational resources there's links to all of them and on the final page you've got both of our uh, email addresses we would both welcome uh, questions and um, or comments and feedback or anything so do feel free to contact us anytime um, we would love to carry on these conversations and, and continue to work together to be excellent service providers to First Nations communities. So, okay. Thank you Megan, thank you Crystal, that I'm going to try I. I. Um, that was a very powerful uh, discussion of what we need to do. Sorry, I need a drink of water, apparently. Um, I was struck by one comment that was made probably halfway through that we need to enter these meetings with a lot to share and, a, and know that we have a lot to learn. And I appreciate that uh, your gentle approach towards um, towards people and uh, thank you so much for sharing with us um, there was quite a few attending today and um, I hope they reach out and connect with you uh, if they have questions have a good day thank you thank you you as well